Uh, thanks for joining us this afternoon. Uh, we are glad to have you here today. Um, you're joining us live. Um, we're excited to share with you about our latest toolkit on trauma-informed SEL and as well to spend time a little bit of time talking about supporting students during these uncertain times we're living in due to the COVID-19 pandemic. I know that's on a lot of our minds as educators, as parents, as people. Um, and so we will be spending some time at the end of this webinar um, talking through a little bit of strategies um, to help support your students in navigating these times and support your efforts as a teacher to help them um, facilitate learning and facilitate SEL even in remote learning circumstances. So thanks again for making it this afternoon. Um, we can go ahead and get started. Our goal for today is to introduce you to our trauma-informed uh, social emotional learning toolkit. Um, this is one of our various resources that are, is a free and openly available resource on Transforming Education's website at www.transformingeducation.org. Um, this toolkit is a 120 minute professional development session designed for educators seeking research-based strategies to create a healthy classroom environment for students who've experienced adversities and trauma, but also for all students. Um, again, this free toolkit is available um, in an editable format to allow you to adapt the presentation to the specific needs of your school or district. Um, it includes a little bit more information about trauma and how it could potentially impact uh, students' learning. Uh, it has a range of strengths-based strategies that you can integrate into your classrooms. It also includes an overview of secondary traumatic stress and strategies for educator self-care. Um, in, in a trauma-informed approach, everybody in the community um, is, is safe and healthy and well. And so we want to make sure that we spend some time thinking about what that means for the educators who are supporting students. It also includes a supplemental handout with additional resources to help you deepen your learning. Um, and a few research articles and papers and links to videos for um, further exploring on your own. And lastly, it includes a facilitator's guide. And so you, it gives you options, um, sort of a pre-structured agenda for you to be able to use this in the 120 minute version or in a more condensed 60 minute version. But ultimately it's a resource that's available to you to use in whatever way um, is most effective and most helpful to your own learning community. So it's a little bit of background on the, on the toolkit. I wanted to share, uh, check in a little bit about norms. Um, we'll be taking a few questions at the end of the session. So please feel free to drop them into the group chat, which you can access by clicking participants at the bottom of your screen. Um, when you click on that, you should get a little um, chat box, uh, usually to the right of your screen. And um, towards the end of the session, when we talk a little bit about the COVID-19 um, navigating those challenges strategies, we'll be dropping in some resources in there. So I encourage you to open that chat box. Um, if you want to join the Twitter conversation, feel free to use the hashtag uh, TraumaInformedSEL to share your takeaways or uh, send us messages. Um, or very importantly, if you have resources that you're relying on right now that you want to make available to other resources, to other educators, Please feel free to use that hashtag um, to communicate with your colleagues. I wanted to share a little bit about who we are at Transforming Education. Uh, we're a Boston-based nonprofit working with schools and school systems across the nation to support educators in fostering the development of the whole child so that all children, particularly those from underserved populations, can thrive. Our vision at Transform Ed is to uh, ensure a future in which all children become thriving adults um, able and empowered to lead personally meaningful lives and to contribute to their communities. An essential part of that is being, um, being empowered to navigate uh, adversity um, and rebound from trauma. And so um, that's where sort of the guiding force was behind uh, developing this free toolkit to educators, for educators. Uh, we partnered with schools and districts serving over a million students across 20 states. Um, and we also partner with other research and practice organizations to expand our impact. There's a um, couple of folks that we've worked, our, um, we've worked with are listed on your screen. Um, and a little bit about who we are, your panelists today. Uh, my name is Akira Gutierrez. I am currently the Child and Youth Development Fellow at TransformEd. Um, I actually worked with TransformEd before that in a different capacity as the Senior Manager of Research Practice Integration. Um, and very recently, I returned um, to graduate school. So I'm also doing a, currently I'm a doctoral student at Florida International University, 
in clinical child and adolescent psychology, where I'm also conducting research on the impact of adversity and trauma on school readiness, particularly as it relates to academic preparedness, parent-child interactions, and social emotional learning. So this topic is really near and dear to my heart as a professional, as a person who is just caring of making sure that our world is okay and, um, and um, sort of as a researcher and educator. I'm joined today by my colleague, Nikki Murphy, from one of our partner schools, North Andover Public Schools, and I'll let her introduce herself. Oh, thank you, Akira. Um, so my name is Nikki Murphy. I am the, uh, as Akira said, the Director of Social Emotional Learning for the North Andover Public School District. So um, in that capacity, I work with um, all the counseling and clinical staff, grades pre-K to 12, and help to um, create um, different programs, curriculum, um, protocols, procedures, all related to social emotional learning and mental health. Um, I've also been a psychotherapist for the last 20 years. I have a private practice in Andover, a neighboring town to North Andover, and I see predominantly um, children and adolescents, but also adults with clinical specialties in uh, trauma, anxiety disorders, and depressive disorders. And then I am a consultant for uh, Walker Consulting, where I'm working on a grant for the Department of Education to create social emotional learning and mental health programming um, for about 30 districts across the Commonwealth. Nikki, thank you so much for joining us today and for this conversation. Um, Nikki was also um, consulted on the docket, and so we really um, appreciate your efforts. Um, originally, we were also supposed to be joined by um, our colleague uh, Monique Castle, who was um, a middle school, who is a middle school math teacher at the Epiphany School in Boston. Um, unfortunately, Monique um, was called away to um, an urgent meeting, and so she's not able to join with us. Join us today. Um, we, uh, Monique did write a blog post um, that's posted on our website about her reflections on being a trauma-informed teacher in the classroom. Um, and I really encourage you to visit our website and read it. It's a really excellent insight into a teacher who's done this work and put it into practice. Um, and Monique was, is also a contributing author to the toolkit. Um, so we thank her very much for her contributions. And we are so sorry to have missed out on having her in this conversation, but really wish her um, well in her own transition to um, uh, distance learning as a teacher. So let's jump in and talk a little bit about what we mean by um, trauma-informed social emotional learning. Uh, trauma-informed SEL is an approach to fostering youth social emotional development that seeks to create a safe and reliable environment where students have experience, who have experienced adversities and trauma feel supported, are welcome to explore their strengths and identities and exercise their agency, can develop meaningful, positive relationships with adults and peers in their learning community, and have access to the mental supports that they need. Um, educators who are using trauma-informed SEL practices recognize their students' strengths and assets and contributions and leverage these opportunities to infuse positive experiences in the classroom to support every child's ability to reach their own potential. They also work to, mod to develop and model their own social emotional skills, and that includes using self-care practices that allow them to be supportive of adults. So it's really a whole learning community approach. When we talk about trauma-informed, uh, using a trauma-informed approach to doing SEL, we mean using a strengths-based approach that, um, to support students' development of social-emotional um, skills, um, rec really recognizing their abilities and their resilience and their potential for growth, even amid uh, challenging circumstances, by tapping into those strengths and the strengths of their cultures and their communities. Um, so just as a point of clarification, this toolkit and its practices are not intended to be an intervention for trauma. Um, we really do um, believe that when, whenever a student um, is in need of um, their, uh, professional support for traumatic experiences, um, it's important to seek professional help. But this toolkit is, ra is more of a generalized approach that considers the needs of this population. as to what we are, um, a couple of key terms as to how we talk about um, trauma-informed and, and um, ACEs on adversity. So uh, 
Ad, you might have heard the term, whoops, skip there. You might have heard the term adverse childhood experiences or ACEs. And these are the experiences, um, the events that have been experienced or witnessed in childhood that are potentially traumatic. Um, it includes experiences of abuse, neglect, or violence, and it includes aspects of a child's environment that can undermine their sense of safety, stability, and bonding. Um, so you might have heard of the ACEs study, which um, was a really, uh, a really monumental study that demonstrated um, strong associations between what happened, adverse circumstances that happened in childhood and sort of suboptimal outcomes in adulthood. Um, and so that's been a really big part of the conversation, um, given our opportunities to sort of intervene in childhood um, through, our, through other direct services and avenues such as education. Um, is sort of why is, is one of the more pressing um, topics of conversation in the ed space. When we're talking about trauma, we're talking about an experience of one or more overwhelmingly stressful events, so some of these ACEs, where um, the child's ability to cope is dramatically undermined. And so these events can be witnessed or experienced directly. It doesn't matter how the child is exposed to it or if they themselves ex um, experience it, but it really causes them to have an extreme psych psychological and, and, and or physiological response due to that feeling of terror and perceived helplessness. That's sort of the traumatic experiences and what we're talking about when we talk about um, the trauma that um, kids can experience. So the strategies that we um, highlight in this toolkit, um, which we'll jump to in just a moment, are informed by the CDC six guiding principles, so trauma-informed approach, which calls attention to several principles, including um, safety, ensuring safety for everybody in the community, and that includes physical and psychological safety, um, uh, promoting trustworthiness and transparency across the members of that community, um, facilitating peer support, uh, collaboration and mutuality and this could be this is if you think about it among peers among adults really fostering an environment where people can work together to problem solve to learn together um, it calls for empowerment and choice making sure that students agency is really at the front and that they feel like they are leading in their learning and really active participants in their learning I'm mute. Apologies about that. Can you hear me now? Okay. Um, really, it calls for attention to cultural, historical, and gender issues, um, making sure that it's an inclusive environment, a space that really students feel welcome to be who they are. And so this also calls for approaching SEL from a strengths-based perspective, uh, recognizing the power of resilience in young people to navigate adversity, and calling for special attention to these principles that we just discussed in doing so. This strengths-based perspective, we consider the power of positive experiences in supporting students in meaningful ways. Um, in the toolkit, you'll find this really excellent and powerful video from Turnaround for Children that explains uh, the latest development, um, the latest in developmental science that tells us even though negative things can really affect children, positive experiences can restore children to a healthy developmental path. And so our goal is to provide you with strategies to help you infuse these positive experiences into your classroom. So trauma-informed SEL practices are um, uh, a set of research-based ways that all classroom teachers can provide this tier one support to create an environment that benefits all their students, including those who have not experienced trauma. Uh, unfortunately, um, if we look at the, level, the rates of prevalence, um, and we talk a little bit more, go in depth a little bit more in the toolkit, um, the likelihood of having children in, our, in your classroom who've experienced um, two or more ACEs or uh, had traumatic experiences is, is, is pretty, the odds are pretty high. And so having, making sure that you're considering those needs in, the, uh, in your classroom community is beneficial to those students, but it really is beneficial to all students, um, whether or not they've, they've um, had those experiences or whether or not you're even aware of them. And so what are these strategies? Um, we talk about a couple, and I'd like to introduce you to a few, to, to the five key ones that we talk about with some sample strategies. Um, so we talk about creating predictable routines, um, certain strategies um, that 
can support children who've experienced these traumatic events adapt to transitions into the classroom a little bit easier so that they feel safe and ready to learn. Um, so one of the examples that um, a sample strategy that we talk about is even just being transparent with students about any changes in the established schedule. And this is something that could be um, done in a lot of ways, even in the current situation where a lot of students are in a remote learning situation, just sort of talking to um, But also modeling your um, modeling your changes um, and how you respond to those changes and those um, your flexibility skills, right? Modeling your own self-regulation skills um, and as you adapt flexibly to any changes in the day. Mm -hmm. There's also, um, we also talk about building strong and supportive relationships. They speak to the building mutualism and support and peer support in the environment. Um, strong relationships can provide uh, the responsiveness, scaffolding and protection that can support children who are feeling the effects of traumatic events. So an example of a strategy could be even spending two minutes a day getting to know a student for, um, we talk about for 10 consecutive days, this is a strategy known as the two by 10 strategies, but the idea is really to connect with students. How are you doing about something other than their learning, right? If you know that they went to, you know, when they're in, in um, soccer season, for example, if you know that they went to soccer, maybe right now at home asking them, you know, what did you, what did you do today to uh, spend some time relaxing? Who did you get to talk to over the phone? Um, just a little quick check-ins and let students know um, that they are, that you are paying attention to them and also that you're thinking about them, but building that relationship sort of outside of the, or through uh, points of connect outside of just the learning environment um, is really helpful to getting to know students and connect to students in your classroom. We also talk about empowering student agency, helping students feel seen, heard, and empowered, finding ways to support their goals and efforts to build the self-efficacy and exercise their agency. A sample of strategies to collaborate with your students to help them problem solve through challenges in the classroom and even in the remote classroom or in the, the virtual classroom. Um, help them create if-then plans, right? So um, what, what will happen if they uh, plan, if they come across a specific challenge? Um, how can they prepare for that? Um, how can they be thinking about sort of these challenges and be prepared for it? Think about ways to help themselves. So giving them that opportunity to exercise their, their agency is also going to help them build their self-efficacy, which is a really important part of empowering um, children who have um, experienced adversity, but really empowering anybody. One thing that I do want to point out is that at the bottom of um, these slides, and you'll find this in the toolkit as well, um, we make we call out attention to additional strategies and other toolkits and resources that we have available. We invite you to um, uh, use click on those links um, and dig into those resources um, wherever as you. We also talk about the supporting, providing opportunities for students to um, develop and practice social emotional self-reg skills. Um, and a critical part of this is practicing, practicing your own self-regulation skills. So one of the ways that we think about is, um, you might have heard of uh, the ruler approach and the mood meter as a tool to check in with um, emotions uh, throughout the day. Um, but model how to use it yourself. Um, a, Modeling is, as you know, is, is a, in a standard um, practice in teaching and making sure that um, students are seeing how you might use it. So you might start the beginning of the day saying, I'm feeling a little bit, you know, uneasy today. I, I don't know, I, maybe you heard something in the news or you heard something um, or something happened in your transition into starting your online learning that um, made you feel a little bit unsure. The idea is to really just sort of name that emotion and show children, show your students that you are also um, finding ways to identify those emotions um, and check in with yourself throughout the day. But that modeling piece is really, really key. We also talk about helping students strengthen and explore their own identities and the perspective of others through various activities that promote agency and civic engagement. So this ties to that principle on, on um, supporting cultural um, uh, and, and gender identities and issues. 
um, using current topics to foster social awareness um, that maybe culminates in a project based in the local community, or maybe you're talking about projects that are happening in the local community, but really helping students um, connect to their communities and sort of their cultural identities as a way of, of empowerment and as a way of, of um, tapping into their identities and their strengths and really celebrating who they are in the classroom. And so that's sort of a, a very brief introduction into um, what we call the uh, our key trauma-informed SEL practices. Again, we um, go deeper into these. There are a lot more strategies embedded into the toolkit. I wanted to give you a sample of what we were talking about today, um, but I definitely invite you to uh, dig into the, the toolkit on your own and find um, the strategies that could be most helpful to you. Um, but at this point, I'd like to also to turn it over to Nikki, um, who will be talking a little bit about um, what it means for her district to move towards a trauma-informed uh, approach. So Nikki, I'll turn it over to you. Great, thank you, Akira. And you're going to move from one slide to the next for me, correct? Okay, excellent. All right, so we can move to the next slide since this is just the opening. We're gonna talk about district level implementation and what it means to move towards um, a trauma-informed district as well as creating trauma-informed schools. So um, when we think about the district level work, um, this is using CASEL's district framework for implementing social emotional learning, but it's very applicable for creating um, trauma-informed SEL practices as well and, and schools in both the classroom, school, and district level. There are four basic focus areas um, in CASEL's framework, and we're predominantly going to look at focus areas one and two today to help us to become more trauma-informed and help all of you become more trauma-informed as a district and in your schools. So um, focus area one is around building foundational support and planning. And that is the organizing phase. And so when we look at this slide, um, we want to look at the four components of building foundational support and planning because we're really organizing, organizing around becoming trauma-informed districts and schools, it's really part of your broader SEL strategic plan. And I know not all schools have a social emotional learning strategic plan um, at the district level or at the school level. Um, but many schools are beginning social emotional learning work. And it's important to see this not, to not have it seen as being sort of different, um, this trauma-informed work, but really is falling under the SEL umbrella. When you think about trauma, anxiety, depression, um, those issues are really the work um, of tier two and three, but they're part of social emotional learning. And so these four components to building the foundational support and plan are having a shared vision and plan, uh, communication that's effective. That's really about your messaging, which we'll talk about um, in more depth in, uh, I believe the next slide. Um, the organizational structure um, that you need in place. Actually, can you move back Akira to the previous slide? Um, thank you. And then the aligned resources. So communication with proper messaging to increase buy-in is, is obviously a must. Um, like I said, we'll talk about that in a minute. Creating an organizational structure that will support becoming trauma-informed is obviously key. And so what does that really look like? We're talking predominantly about teaming, both at the district level and having school-based teams that really have a meaningful dialogue, uh, promote collaboration to design the structures that will break down these silos and bring sort of a co cohesiveness to your approach in your district and in your schools. And this systemic approach really is, is there to help support the sustainability, the buy-in, and the accountability of all involved with the task of creating a trauma-sensitive district. Um, when we talk about aligning resources, we're talking about sustainability, right? That's always an issue in any district. And you're gonna to wanna to look at things like the resources that you have already in place. And I'm talking about both human personnel resources and fiscal resources. Um, and we've gotta look at things like, does your district prioritize social emotional learning um, and or trauma-informed SEL already? And then kind of tap into some of your existing resources. Uh, next slide, please. So it really all starts with the organizational structures because those structures once they're in place are gonna be doing the work of helping to create a trauma-informed school or district. And so it starts, of course, with creating a really strong team. They're gonna work on the vision, communicating the message that gets created, getting buy-in, creating the, F the action plan for creating a trauma-sensitive school or district, um, 
So in North Andover, we started with creating a district level team. And that included building level administrators, um, like principals, et cetera, and then district um, level administrators like myself and assistant superintendents. Um, and we create sort of the initial vision and the messaging at that level. Um, the district team can also write a SEL trauma-informed um, types of goals into our strategic plan, which we've done in North Andover. Uh, super important because obviously that's approved by your school committee and then it really prioritizes SEL and trauma-informed work as being key to something your district cares about. And then of course there's action items that you have to follow through with um, and you're accountable for. And uh, SIPs are school um, improvement plans. So um, a lot of schools have those, some don't. We actually don't in North Andover, but, but most schools do. Um, and your building level teams are gonna work on writing some, some goals around how to become trauma-informed and integrate that into the school improvement plan. Um, that really also, again, makes it a priority, makes the staff understand that um, the building level administrators and at the district level that it's a priority um, to help students that um, have experienced trauma. So you wanna look at when you're looking at teaming, what existing teams may be in place to implement this work or do you need to form new teams? Um, we don't wanna have a redundancy. There's a lot of initiatives out there and it's important to make sure that we're tapping into who the champions of the work will be. Um, those SEL teams, uh, trauma teams will work on things like, you know, delivering professional development around how to become a trauma-informed district using things like the toolkit, which is highly effective. I've used it um, in North Andover, and I'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. Um, but also, you know, if you don't have a director of social emotional learning, which I know a lot of schools do not, um, you probably do have some social workers or some school psychologists, and even some that might, um, specialized in trauma uh, like I do because they might have a, a practice, um, a private practice outside of the school setting and they can provide some trainings and use the toolkit um, to help schools become more trauma informed. Uh, next slide, please. Can you hear me next slide? Yep, thank you, Akira. <clears throat> so messaging and buy-in um, and what really resonates with key stakeholders I know is, is a huge um, challenge for a lot of districts. We know that social emotional learning um, is a priority for people, at least verbally they, they say that, but then trying to fit it in amongst all these other initiatives is tough. And um, we know that kids with trauma um, are pretty extensive, uh, more so in some districts than others, but it still tends to be one of the, those number one uh, clinical populations you see in most districts, whether they're suburban, urban, urban fringe, uh, rural, we see trauma, we see anxiety and depression as being really the top three kind of clinical populations um, in the school setting. So I think when you think about messaging um, and building foundational support, persuasive messaging to really increase buy-in from diverse stakeholders is key. And so how do we do that? Um, how do we get buy-in from the people that are really gonna push this work and prioritize it? I think that The message that trauma-informed is best practice for all students has resonated in my district as I've done the messaging around how important this trauma work is. I think when we start to, when you review the toolkit and you see what's offered, you can see that a lot of the practices in place are not only helpful for kids that are quote tier three kids or even tier two kids that are at risk and have trauma histories, but really just best practices for creating really solid relationships and positive cultures and climates in schools that are trauma-informed for all kids and for staff. So it's really a tier one um, practice. And I think that when schools are looking at what's gonna um, capture the most benefit for the most amount of students, um, if you can message around trauma-informed as being best practice for all students, that's very helpful. Um, but we need these talking points to convince people with power, right? That's school committee members, that's leadership at the district and building level. That's also union leadership because we need um, union leaders to help spread the message that this work is really important. I think another talking point that's worked um, well for me in North Andover is that, you know, teachers and administrators um, tend to be the least educated about uh, mental health issues because it's not part of their teacher prep program. Uh, they don't have clinical or counseling background. And it also is 
consistently, at least in North Andover and two other school districts that I um, worked in previously, social emotional learning, trauma, kids with mental health struggles, anxiety, these are the, the number one topics that teachers are consistently asking for help with um, and asking for professional development um, around this topic more than anything else. And I think that's a major selling point when you're trying to message um, to get some, some buy-in from key stakeholders. Um, so it might seem cold, but um, when you look at the bullet point number four around tier three students, OOD is out of district cost. I mean, schools, budgets are very real. Schools are a business. Nobody likes to hear that, but we all need money in order to keep ourselves afloat and surviving to support the students and the staff that we want to support and help. And so we need to think about <clears throat> um, keeping kids in districts and providing them with what it is they need um, that they deserve to have within their home district if that's what the, the most appropriate setting is for them. And um, I think really messaging about why does creating a trauma-informed school or district matter, why do teachers need to know how to work with kids with trauma histories, yes, because it's the right thing to do, but also messaging around how this work will save us money as a district. And I think if you're trying to get buy-in from district leaders, that's an important talking point is to say, you know, the more teachers we have trained and the more administrators we have trained in how to implement um, and create trauma-informed classrooms, trauma-informed schools, the more likely we are to be able to really create a safe and supportive learning environment for these students and keep them in district. So it's, it matters. Um, as district administrators, we have to look at budgets and we have to think about money. So um, don't shy away from, from making that point. Um, I think there's a growing number of tier two kids. Um, the kids are at risk that need services and a lot of those kids have trauma histories that haven't necessarily been identified yet. Some have, but some have not. And so I think that is um, that, you know, when we think about the MTSS, the tiered approach, um, we often talk about, oh, we get some good stuff at tier one, we get some good stuff at tier three, but these tier two kids, I mean, this is a growing number of kids with, with all these issues and we don't know what to do with them. And we don't have enough services in place for them. So this type of toolkit is really effective in um, helping to reach those kids before they decompensate and end up being a kid that needs a more intensive type of um, setting that's more restrictive within the school environment or out of district. And then of course there's data. So, um, you know, everyone wants data, right? We're always looking for some existing data sources um, in our schools, but the toolkit has some great nationwide stats and data on trauma. If you don't have existing district or school specific data on kids impacted by trauma in your district or school, which a lot of schools don't. If you have um, implemented a universal screener or administered some, um, some surveys like we've done um, with Transforming Ed in our district, then you might have some data um, on some school specific issues around the kids suffering from trauma and how that's impacting their learning. But if you don't have that, the toolkit is a great place to go for some data to help with the messaging for, um, for, for district and, and school-based administrators. So the next slide, please. So uh, let's see. When we get into, once we've organized and we're getting into sort of the implementation phase, um, one of the key things, and you've probably heard a lot of this talk lately, that all um, social emotional learning is starts with the adults. Um, I think we have to remember that not only do we have students that are suffering from trauma or have um, past trauma histories, but we also have a lot of adults that have trauma histories. And I think people forget that. Um, there's a, a lot of teachers in your schools and counselors that have uh, trauma histories. And they need some support, um, but they also feel triggered sometimes by kids that have trauma in their classroom because they haven't necessarily worked through some of their own trauma. So in order to strengthen adult competency and capacity in our schools, we need to first start with increasing central office expertise. Um, and I've used the toolkit to help increase uh, knowledge um, from not just staff, but building level administrators. And we can use it for central office expertise also. It's a great um, professional learning um, toolkit. So um, in North Ando, for, for, for example, we have sort of the rollout plan is we started with um, doing a lot of professional development using the toolkit. 
um, in most of the schools. I've hit most of the schools this year so far since the toolkit um, became accessible to me. And I have three more schools to present to using the toolkit with excellent feedback so far um, on how helpful it, it's been for them in, in increasing their own competence. Um, and capacity around understanding trauma and understanding what types of practices they want to put into place in their classroom or in their schools. So I think that's super important um, as part of implementation. And then um, you, the last bullet point there around staff trust, um, community, and efficacy. If you could go to the next slide, Akira, that would be helpful. Thank you. Um, I think, you know, in order to really build staff trust and a sense of community, we have to take care of our educators and we have to acknowledge the very difficult work that they do every day. Um, it can be tough for educators who are used to having control of their classrooms and being in an authoritative role to acknowledge that they can get burned out, but we all can get burned out, whether you're a counselor in a school, an administrator, um, a nurse, it doesn't matter what it is you're doing. Um, we have a very difficult job working with kids that, that are struggling with some pretty significant mental health issues, trauma being one of the number one issues. So in order to take care of our educators, we need to create positive environments for staff as well as, as students. And creating trauma-sensitive schools is going to help our staff members as well as our students because it's about creating a safe and supportive environment that's focused on building really strong relationships, not just from staff, to students, but between staff members themselves and between educators and their administrators. Um, and, you know, there's just a lot of adults that have these trauma histories. And so you've got to remember that, I think Akira mentioned it before, creating a trauma-informed environment is not just about the person who experienced the trauma, but it's also about the people providing the care, which are the educators and the counselors who can get what we call compassion fatigue. And essentially what that is, is it's similar to burnout. Um, and the idea is that when you are in a, a position of constantly providing support in a caring profession, like education and mental health are, um, in schools, we can get, we can sort of lose our compassion sometimes because we're just exhausted from being in that role. So I think just naming that it happens at all, that educators get compassion fatigue and get burned out um, is a trauma-informed approach in and of itself because it's, connecting us all and making us very human and acknowledging that this is tough work that we're doing and that we don't have all the answers and that educators need a lot of support and education around um, how to help kids with trauma, which this toolkit, again, does very, very effectively. There is a tool that I did want to mention. It's called ProQual, um, and you'll be able to access that link um, when this is posted, um, this webinar is posted um, on Transforming Ed's website. And ProQual stands for the Professional Quality of Life Measure. And essentially what it is, is um, I believe there's, there's 26 or 36 questions. I can't remember. It's been, uh, it's been a minute since I've administered it to teachers um, in a district. But it's a self-assessment for educators and administrators looking at their own level of um, sort of compassion, fatigue, and burnout, and also the areas of strengths that they, that they still have um, to be able to help kids with trauma, with anxiety. Um, but it's not evaluative, it's for them. Nobody's looking at it besides them. And it's, it's helping them to start to self-assess and say, all right, where am I? What do I need help with? Where am I struggling? And I think it's an important tool to help educators know that we're here to support them and that we understand the work they're doing is very difficult. So that is all I have for today, I believe. Is there, are there any other slides or was that it? Um, I think that's I think the last. That's it. Yeah, I think that's it. Okay. I just have one question that comes up pretty commonly um, among folks when we're talking about trauma informed SEL is um, we talked about this as sort of the tier one approach, and we talked about the increasing needs of uh, supports at the tier two and tier three level. Um, what would you recommend a teacher do if a child does um, disclose that they are in in sort of um, in challenging circumstances or, or experiencing sort of severe or even any kind of neglect and abuse at home. So anytime a child sort of would disclose um, uh, trauma or trauma history or being in a traumatic, a potentially traumatic event, um, what would you recommend teachers do in that case? Thank you, Akira. So this is, this is a great question because 
it happens often. Um, and I'm sure every administrator or uh, for the educators on the phone, someone has probably, and if they haven't yet, they will at some point potentially um, disclose to you something about their own trauma history. First and foremost, I would say everyone needs to, of course, follow what your district procedures are and your school procedures are. Um, everyone's a mandated reporter, so it has to be reported. Um, and I think most people know that and typically will go immediately to a guidance counselor, an adjustment counselor, social worker, whatever resources, clinical counseling resources you have in your school and report that this child has said something to them that they're concerned about and they're not sure how to navigate. I have had the experience um, quite a few times actually of teachers very well intended and administrators sometimes very well intended um, who have a good relationship with the child and that's why the child is close to them to begin with. And so they tried to support them. And they did that by sitting and listening and asking questions and trying to get as much information as they could so that the child would feel supported. Sometimes they felt they should, they could handle it themselves. They didn't want to run to a guidance counselor or adjustment counselor to report it because either they weren't sure they needed to or they felt like they handled it well themselves. But again, we're all mandated reporters, and I think the first thing you need to do is take the child, and of course this looks different, by the way, when we say at the elementary versus middle school versus high school level. Um, those are all different students at different stages of development. They're all going to have potentially different reactions when you do this, but you need to let them know that you are a mandated reporter. You need to let them know what that means, that you're going to bring them to their guidance or, uh, counselor or adjustment counselor. And, and that they need to report that to that uh, professional who is skilled at interviewing, at supporting, and knows exactly what to do. Um, if you get pushback, which you might from the student, especially depending on their age, they may not want to tell their guidance counselor, they may not feel connected to that person, um, that's a tough position. And sometimes, you know, I've had a couple of teachers that said, you know, I immediately knew I had to tell the guidance counselor and I told the student, let's walk down to your guidance counselor's office and tell them. And that student either wasn't connected to that person or it had a bad experience with an adjustment counselor, guidance counselor, and they didn't want to. And they started to kind of flip out a little bit and um, become dysregulated. And the teacher needed to call for some support in the classroom and then you know, help to bring the student down to the counselor's office. I just think it's super important to understand that as an educator, this isn't your background. It's, you might be excellent at connecting with students, um, but this does not fall on you to handle alone, nor should it. And again, refer back to your school or district policies, but most of those policies are going to say, connect them immediately to a guidance or adjustment counselor, because that person is going to have to report it to DCF. And you might be part of that phone call, um, but you don't need to do that alone. And you need to do it with somebody who's skilled and knows exactly what to ask and what not to ask um, when some kind of trauma has been disclosed to them. Thanks so much, Nikki. I appreciate your insight on that. I know that's a sort of a, it's a difficult situation in a lot of ways. Um, and so I think it's important folks are always finding sort of the right guidance, looking for the right guidance to what to do in that circumstance. So thank you for your insight on that. I'd like, to, I'd like to transition us to talk a little bit about um, sort of the current circumstances and the challenges that our students and, and us, right, our, our, the adults and everybody in the learning community right now is navigating some very unique challenges related to the COVID-19 pandemic. And I know that's in a lot of our minds. So we wanted to talk a little bit about a couple of strategies that you might be able to engage as you're in sort of distance uh, learning, um, taking a distance learning approach. Um, and so trying to support your students and, and figuring out how to do it in real time, um, which is happening sort of for a lot of folks across the country. So to talk a little bit about a couple of strategies and a couple of resources that are available, um, I wanted to highlight um, some sort of key recommendations that are coming across, uh, that are coming, um, that are rising to the top as sort of important practices. Being aware that students might be um, stressed out by this process in a variety of ways. Different um, children and families are navigating these challenges in, in sort of in very different ways. Um, 
and are having to see uh, sort of different uh, challenges that they're experiencing that maybe they didn't need to be, they didn't need to worry about two weeks ago or even one week ago. So always remembering that children and, and those students and their families are sort of, there. there's not one right way to process the, the current events um, or, or one common way, right? We all process it differently. So being mindful of that, that range of, of, um, of um, pop, you know, emotional expression. So there's also importance in um, keeping a, an open dialogue with your students and providing opportunities for, the, for them to share what's on their mind. I know um, one of the questions that came up in the chat is like, how can we foster an, a, a, an online, a safe online environment right now? One of the things that I, is important that we hear from experts is to really make sure that we're talking to students um, at a developmentally appropriate way. And so there are several resources that um, we're plugging into, we're gonna plug into the chat box on um, guiding documents, um, some documents, for example, um, there's the one by NPR, it includes this comic, this is a piece of that comic, um, where you can talk um, to your students through, um, through the explanation of what might be happening about why we need to be extra healthy with our IG practices right now, what it means uh, for some folks to get sick, why we're having to stay home. Um, but it's really opening that dialogue and um, finding ways to help them sort of make sense of all the information that's probably coming at them is important. Um, providing opportunities for them to lead the conversations and share what's on their minds. So maybe they're wondering, maybe they're seeing mom and dad a little bit more stressed and so one helping them sort of creating that space for them to be able to bring up those questions or, um, you know, why, why can't they go and see their friends? Why can't they play in the park together with their friends? um is is you know a very important question that is important to just name and have an open conversation about so these resources we have some from harvard medical school there's one from pbs kids for younger children that includes some videos um to help sort of facilitate those conversations um these are some tools that you might refer to um there's also the challenge of maintaining those strong relationships those teacher student and peer relationships during these periods of um, distance learning and social distancing. Um, so finding opportunities to touch base. Um, some te te different teachers and have taken different approaches. Um, so for example, maybe sharing a little bit more openly if people are at home, maybe you have pets, maybe that's something that you could share with your classroom. Maybe you've already shared with your classroom and really taking those opportunities to, um, to connect with your students in, in more creative ways and um, given sort of the limitations. Um, there's also a, a lot of opportunity in practicing um, naming and talking through the emotions that they're experiencing. So use, using different tools from that. Again, in reference to the mood meter, which is um, sort of one of my favorite tools, there's a variety of mood meters that you could use. Um, there's an, uh, we have up here an emoji meter um, where kids could talk about what face looks like them and what, which emoji looks like them the most um, in the moment or represents their feelings the most. And what does that mean? Um, and even just naming that, um, that emotion and maybe you do, you also name, like maybe I feel like, um, the emoji with the tongue out because I saw something, you know, gross or something, or, or I'm a little bit worried today. Again, anything that really models for students that really you're just checking in. Um, the goal is not to sort of contribute to the panic, but just to name that we're feeling different emotions the entire, during, during this whole thing. And we might feel differently in the morning than we do in the afternoon. Afternoon. We might feel differently at the beginning of a session than we do at the end of a session, and that's okay, but it's just important to sort of take that moment and check in. And so we're dropping in the, um, in the chat box a couple of links. One is from restorative practices on different kinds of relationship meters and emoji meters, emotion mood meters that you might be able to use. Um, you, can, um, you can use these resources, plug them into your online classroom. Uh, learning, for example, and have used different um, pictures and different images for, for you all to reference. Um, uh, the folks at Yale's um, Center um, for uh, Social Emotional Intelligence or Emotional Intelligence have also um, recently released an article on EdSearch, and we plug that link in there as well for um, different ways that you can facilitate social emotional learning in this sort of um, online environment during this crisis. There's also sort of in thinking about currently and in moving forward as things continue to shift, 
I know that for me, things have been shifting on a day to day. Um, and so they will, I, I suspect that they will continue shifting for many of us. And so pra practicing again, um, helping students readjust to different schedules and different asks. Some schools are coming back from spring break, but it's a different kind of coming back, right? Because now you're coming back, but you're actually at home. And so really exercising that flexibility and, um, and demonstrating. And a question came up about um, what do we mean by like adapting, um, modeling sort of the adaptability? Does it mean like you show, you can maybe, there's like a metacognitive cognitive moment of saying like, okay, I'm gonna be flexible. I knew that I came in here wanting to Um, really, in this moment, I need to cover um, these other pieces. Um, but even being transparent about that, again, that goes back to that principle on transparency and trustworthiness, just showing kids that you are also a human being and you're also navigating these challenges. And so maybe you want to say, I'm going to take a deep breath before I transition into this next session, because that was, that, was that was a new information for me. Could show kids that it's okay to do that. And it's okay to constantly be like, oh, I need to check in again. Uh, or to be wondering, um, to, to be aware that the, the, the things are very, are different right now. Um, <clears throat> again, checking in with students and families, being cognizant that they may be experiencing new, hard, experiencing new hardships since you last saw them. Um, you know, unfortunately, as, as we're seeing in the news, folks are, um, uh, a lot of folks are uh, having to cut back on hours. Um, some folks are already reporting job loss. Um, so the circumstances are just wildly different on a day to day. Um, and so being mindful that families are facing sort of those different kinds of stressors um, and, and what, what students are, might be tuning into. Um, because perhaps they don't have the words for it, but chances are they're picking up on, on, on extra stresses at home. Um, so being aware of that. And um, once, once sort of we're back in the classroom, or if you even see it now, seeking professional support if students show um, signs of trauma that are not resolving quickly. So you might see an elevation in sort of behavioral challenges or emotional responses that are really, um, or behaviors that are brand new, um, particularly after we're, you sort of, we're back in the classroom, we're trying to achieve a new normal, um, figuring out um, when, when, to tap to, when to tap in for additional supports, whether that's in your school or in your community, um, finding um, folks to reach out to um, to help you identify those supports for your students is very important. Um, Child Trends released an article um, earlier today, in fact, on other ways of, of supporting children's emotional well-being. Um, so we invite you to take a look into that. It has additional strategies. Um, and at the tail end, it has a lot of other resources that you can explore, um, some links that you can explore on your own um, to, to help, you, help support you sort of in facilitating learning and facilitating well-being for your students um, in the middle of all this. And finally, thinking about things, um, think about thinking about ways to infuse some more positive experiences. Um, one is looking for the helpers. Um, you might have heard of uh, Mr. Rogers' um, uh, anecdote that his mother reminded him that during difficult times, you should look for the helpers, right? People are coming together. There's, there's helpers out there. Um, so maybe you might want to check in with students or help your communities today. Maybe a neighbor came over or somebody dropped off um, groceries because, um, you know, mom and dad or their parents were at work. Um, and so they dropped off, um, um, they saw somebody dropping off groceries for them, provisions for them that were needed. Maybe the, the, the school um, giving out breakfast and lunch is an opportunity um, to say, oh, somebody was very kind to me when they gave me my meals for today. I mean, things like that are really important to sort of name and acknowledge to remind students that people are doing things to help one another in the community and that we're really not alone in all this. Um, particularly, you know, in the circumstances, it's, it can be very challenging, but it's also really important to take a step back and remember um, that there, there's good stuff happening out there. And then very aligned to that, practicing gratitude and compassion, um, thinking about, encouraging kids to think about um, who can you say thank you today, even within their family, right? Um, who helped you today? And how did you help somebody else? Um, I saw this great video went viral on Twitter of, of this third grader who recorded himself um, 
uh, modeling for his peers how to access his online learning platform. He just recorded a video, um, and it was just such a nice moment of reminding, um, of remembering that kids really can help in a lot of different ways, right? So we all need to be creative about it, but it's important to remind them that they are not, they are not helpless in all this, right? There are different ways that they can contribute. Um, to solutions at home and through the online learning. Um, so helping them think through those kinds of ways um, and then recognizing that, really naming those, those strengths and those beautiful actions that we're seeing. So again, um, Greater Good um, published an article on how to keep um, the greater good in mind um, during the coronavirus outbreak and that link is also in your chat box. So we've addressed a couple of your questions here um, on, uh, during, um, during the last couple of minutes, um, but I'm wondering if anybody has um, any additional questions of uh, things that we haven't um, quite yet uh, covered, either for Nikki or for me. Um, I know that somebody was um, asking about, again, about implementing these strategies um, and with what flexibility. Really, um, ultimately you are you are the uh, expert in your own classroom community, right? And you're expert in what works with your your students, you know your students best. And so adapt these strategies, find ways to adapt them that are going to make, be meaningful to you. Um, the goal is not really to do it right in any one specific way. The goal is to get is to do it in a way that's going to help support you in your learning. And um, Akira, I have a um, question that somebody asked that I'd like to answer. So um, there was a question uh, right back at the beginning. Um, someone was asking about, are we aware of the, the state of Massachusetts Safe and Supportive Schools framework and how the toolkit, toolkit might complement it very well? Um, so I, I, I agree completely, first of all. Um, I want to say that. But I have um, used this, um, the Mass Safe and Supportive um, Schools uh, framework in um, a previous district that I was in, and then um, also um, the districts that we're working with now um, to uh, across the state, is, they're also using that assessment tool as well. So for those of you that don't know what it is, and you can find it on the DESTI website, it's an excellent tool for assessing where your school is at um, in terms of school operations. It looks at sort of six areas of focus. Um, it looks at leadership and culture, professional development, access to services, um, teaching and learning, policies, procedures, and protocols, and then collaboration with families and family engagement. And essentially what you're doing is your team, either at the district level um, or school-based level, would assess what you have in place. And part of the purpose is to reduce redundancy in uh, teaming and in services, because a lot of times we find in a school, we might not have an FDL team or a team looking at trauma or mental health, but we have a team looking at truancy and a team looking at some other issue that all might fall under this umbrella of um, the things that are not traditionally academic that help to support the whole child and their development. So um, I would suggest taking a look at that assessment tool and potentially using it because it, it can help you create some really good data, which then will help to drive your um, action plan around how you're going to implement uh, data sensitive, excuse me, trauma sensitive um, practices at both the school level, the district level, and then in your classrooms as well. So I just wanted to address that question because I think it's important. We need to make sure we have data that's driving the decisions we're making around um, supporting kids with trauma and creating safe and supportive school environments for staff as well. Thank you so much for that, Nikki. I appreciate that. Um, we have a couple of questions about different strategies and so some additional strategies. Um, again, we do encourage you just to be mindful of the time. We do encourage you to check out a couple of strategies. Um, so one question came up, for example, about promoting attendance in the in the classroom, particularly among kids who've experienced who are experiencing ACEs or um, trauma. Um, and we would encourage you to read on on building strong relationships. That sense of belonging is really important to help to encourage. making sure that families um, you know, have the resources that they need. And so connecting with your community, connecting families to their community resources to make sure that they have the support systems in place to be able to, 
um, support their kids coming to uh, coming to school. Um, somebody also asked about um, about trauma imposed by maybe in their educational experiences. Um, I think there's a lot in there about, uh, or there's a lot of um, one of the things that we speak to is on. Um, sort of um, historical and racial trauma, and so really finding um, ways to explore implicit bias among among folks, um, if that's sort of a an, um, is a, is an important way to start. Um, but really building the adult capacity around understanding these issues, I think, is is really critical to creating that trauma informed environment. Um, I would so again, add here as well. I know we have to finish, but I just real brief. Um, I would like to add that. Um, the toolkit absolutely addresses this. It was actually one of the things when I used the toolkit um, and uh, professional development for staff across the district, they, it was very eye-opening for a lot of teachers to say, oh, wow, and administrators, oh, there's some things we're doing here that are actually, um, you know, making trauma worse for these kids, which, of course, again, unintended most of the time, of course. Um, so the toolkit does address that. Um, again, both school-wide practices that you can put into place, for example, things around fire drills and just different things that we can do to help not trigger kids and have them dysregulated for the rest of the day. And then specific practices in the classroom. So I think you'll find the toolkit very helpful in addressing that question. Thank you, Nikki. appreciate that. Um, again, being mindful of time, I just want to take a moment to acknowledge all the colleagues who contributed, um, whether thought consultation um, in, in various capacities in developing this resource. Um, I invite you again to visit our website to download this and other resources. There are several other topics again, on relationship, on agency, on mindfulness, which is something that you might want to um, consider if you haven't already, um, in terms of bringing that into the classroom to, um, to buffer sort of the effects of stress that we're feeling right now. Uh, we invite you to follow us on Twitter where we're, con trying to, where we're continuing the conversation um, about promoting uh, social emotional learning and really whole child development for all all students um, across the country. If you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to us at info at transformingeducation.org. Um, again, thank you for joining us today. Um, we um, hope this was useful to you. And we really wanna hear from you. Please let us know how this, in what ways this uh, toolkit was useful and what ways it could be more useful in the future um, so that we can um, sort of um, be creating resources that are, are most helpful to you. And thank you all for joining us. Uh, we hope you have a, a great afternoon and we all hope you, we hope you all stay si uh, safe and well. Thank you. Thank you.